We're live here, and uh, we're in Coral Reef Yacht Club, Marcus Coy, Mark Struby, and I invented this thing called the cleat slide. I'm calling it the cleat slider, because you can slide over it on the deck, and you can also slide ropes right into the cleat. So if you're a skipper and you're driving the pole back, you just have to pull it over, and it goes right in. It's not like you have to lift the line up and drop it in perfectly. It just goes, you pull it where it needs to be, and it goes right in. A lot faster, a lot more reliable, uh, quicker, cleaner. For this one in particular, this one I use because <clears throat> on the starboats you slide forward and back a lot, so your weight placement is really important. So sometimes the skipper says move forward, and you're like, well, I'm getting the cleat. I don't want to move forward anymore. With this, you can actually sit on top of it, and it's, it's pretty comfortable. So that's, that's it. That's Fleet good slide. product. Good product. Thank you, Marcus. <laughs> Welcome back to another edition of uh, Inside Great Lake Sailing. My name is Greg Norman. We're lucky enough to have with us uh, one of the most outstanding sailors this country has produced. And we're talking to Mark Struby from uh, San Diego, of all places, an old stomping grounds for me. And, and I always start these interviews off with a question. And we're going to do something different. We typically start and ask questions about background and you know, where you started. But you've got something next to you that you have an invention. And being in a grinder is part of the process. So I. Let's, let's talk about the cleat that you started with. That's my first question is, how did you come up with it? What is it? And is it available for guys like me who don't have a clue what to sell? Um, yes, it's definitely available for guys like you. Um, when I was sailing stars, a lot of times you come home with a lot of bruises on your hips because the star has a lot of cleats that are placed right where you want to sit and move around. And because the star is such a physical boat, you know, sometimes you want to be behind the cleat. Sometimes you want to be in front of the cleat. The only way to get in front of it is to either slide over it or stand up. And so you're always moving around on boats and I kept getting the bruises on the hip. So I started thinking, well, what if I made a little fairing, a little plate that went over the top of it um, to eliminate a lot of the bruising, but also to help guide the line in. So it's not just a matter of when you, you know, when you hit the side of it, you're hitting a sort of a hard edge. You're also ramping up. And when you pull the rope, you don't have to lift the line up and drop it in perfectly. You can just slide the rope right over the side of it. And I've got the small ones for the micro cleats, the regular ones for the, uh, the, like the Harkin 150s. And then I've got a half slider for a lot of boats like the J70 have two pleats right next to each other. And you can't put a cleat over the top because they're, they're going to hit each other. So whenever you have two cleats or a bulkhead and a cleat or something where you need a half slider, you can, you know, get one of those things. So it's for performance, you know, to, to make a click quick, uh, cleat quicker, um, you know, for lack, you know, uh, bruising, you know, so you're not getting bruised all the time. And right. then you're not also ripping your gear. So those are kind of the three main things. Is it, is there, is there a cruising option to that? I might, I might say option, but is there, is it, if I do a lot of one, I'm by myself on my 30 old day. So it seems to me from the cockpit, that would be a perfect a cleat to have in the back to be able to, to one hand it. Uh, it is. And, you know, there's a lot of boats that it can go on. For example, I, I do this race of star boat and you can use these things all over the star boat, but I've also put them on etchels. They've got the jib cleats up on the cabin tops. I put them on sonars. Uh, Magnus Lilydahl down in Miami runs uh, Team Paradise Sailing, and we put them on his boat. And he likes them there. Um, the J70s. I just got them on a J70 in Miami for this last weekend when I was uh, there for Bacardi Cup. So those are that's five different classes of boats. 420 is the Club 420 for kids. Um, the junior instructors that I just spoke to in Miami seem to like it a lot, and um, so they're going to start putting it on their boats. Uh, my dad's got uh, a junior program. Started over in Charlotte Harbor, uh, the Charlotte Harbor, Harbor Sailing Association, I think is what it is. It's, and so he put a couple on those boats. So it's right now I'm kind of in the testing phase. When I first brought this out, it was COVID. So I couldn't really, you know, six months of regattas were canceled. So I've kind of been go, showing up at regattas with a half dozen or a dozen and, and selling on some of the guys. And it's, it's starting to kind of pick up a little bit, which is which is nice, but any boat that has a cleat that you, whether it's in your ribs on the back, you know, sometimes they put the cleats inside the combings, right. or if it's something where you're sitting on, that's a perfect spot for the cleat. Which kind of price on those? And the question, the follow-up question, is there a patent on that? Yes, yeah, so I've got two patents. Um, the prices are basically $15.95 for the small one, $19.95. And then you buy two with this one, it's you get a, a right and a left. So I didn't want to mess with like, you're going to get the right, you need the right one or, oh, I ordered the left one. So I figured, you know what, just Get both. If you only need one side, give your, you know, give the other one to your buddy. Um, but yeah, any any kind of boat that has something where you're, you know, oh, you're on. And the price is right, 30, 20, and 16. Is this your first sort of jump into retail? Uh, yes, it is. <laughs> so the, the way that I got started was 
was, um, you know, obviously sailing around boats and getting bruised. But then I did a, a Melgus 24 event with um, a patent attorney. And so we started talking about this and he thought, hey, this is a this is a really good idea. I could put it on my scows. I could put it on my melges. I could put it on all these other boats. And I was like, yeah, it's perfect. So he helped me for about a year developing and getting the patent. There's a utility patent and then another patent on there. Um, drawing a blank on what it is, but there's two patents for each one. And, uh, and you know, without him, you know, helping me out, it would have taken me a lot longer to get that patent stuff developed. But there's patents. My girlfriend helped me with the packaging and it's all just kind of come together. As a new uh, inventor, is it, it, were you, are you surprised by the process? You know, I'm, I'm a guy um, who has an idea. It's, it's gotta be, it's gotta be an interesting discussion, just kind of getting it to market. It is. And there, there was a lot of, you know, R and D that went in, you know, I, I started this thing with a, you know, uh, what did I use? I, um, well, it was, it was basically 3d printing. So I kind of came up with the idea. I had a friend that's a star sailor that's also a, a CAD guy. So he developed a, you know, made kind of the original ones. And I started working on the slope and angles, um, testing them on boats. I mean, the first ones that I had, had a, had a base in them. And the second ones I had, I put a hole in it. Cause I thought it's hard to get, you know, you got to get the bolts off, put this thing underneath it, regroup it and then put the bolts back down. So I, I thought maybe I could just make a flat bottom thing, put some goop on that, put it over the top. But the problem with that, that test was uh, after about a year, the, the glue failed and the cleat slider popped off. And I, I didn't want to be losing these things overboard in, in the ocean. So I thought I have to put the bottom plate on there. So it was probably three years of kind of research development, another year of, you know, getting the patent and then working on the packaging, getting the tool made. I mean, there's, there is a lot to it. Is distribution the next big hurdle? Yes. Yeah. Is that the it hardest is, yeah. hurdle? Is that the hardest hurdle? It is. I mean, a couple of years ago, I had, you know, really no sales. Last year, I, I, I jumped up a little bit, nothing to cover the cost of the, uh, the patent or the tool yet, but it's picking up. And I've, um, you know, one thing with, uh, that I have going for me is that I was uh, Bill Goggins sailing instructor as a kid. So, and he's with Harkin. And so I'm talking to Harkin and we're, you know, still talking. Um, nothing's, you know, in stone or anything, but uh, we'll see where that goes. Cause that could, that could really help with the distribution. And I know they're in 54 countries and, you know, the products that they have are, are, are good products. So. You always see these conversations about shelf space at a grocery store and we're at, we're at eye level and what they pay and you, you, the, the shark tank, I think is one of those shows that always has that discussion when we're talking food products, I would think it would be just as cutthroat with, uh, with Marine uh, items and things of that nature. Yeah. And right now it's, I'm just selling it on my website. So it's very small traffic that's coming through, but ultimately I'd like to get them on the shelves. Um, I've, sh I've talked to a couple of their major retailers and it seems like I'm, you know, the feedback that I'm getting from the people that have used it and the people that I'm presenting it to, it's all good feedback, but it's just a matter of, you know, it's breaking into the thing and getting the right people to start talking about it. And for me, it's a lot of, it's just word of mouth. You know, once people put it on their boat and they see the advantage of, you know, how you're not going to, bruise yourself or how fast it is to cleat the line in or you're not going to tear your gear up and, and and lines don't catch you know if you have a you get a line that flips over the top of a cleat and all of a sudden that goes tight it hits the cleat you can either rip the cleat off or you know whatever you got to try to bowstring it off with this it just slides right over the top so you have a video that you produced for this on your website that i'm hoping we're able to use and, and show everybody but it's, it looks to me like it's one of those things where you look down at it and you go you're sitting you know you're a sailing you're a racing sailor and you look down and go, why didn't I think of that? It's just yeah. it's such a simple thing, but it's such a, an effective product, I would think. Yeah, I've had some some friends say that, why didn't I think of that? But it is, it is like I said, it's a long process. And I mean, it's not going to make me millions or anything. It right. makes me a few dollars here and there. That's, you know, that's what I'm looking cool. for. season of uh, our Inside Great Lakes Sailing Show. We're lucky enough to have with us today, Mark Struby, and uh, we've been talking a little bit about some cleats. And uh, Mark, I want to go all the way back. You grew up in the Milwaukee area? Yes, and, uh, yeah, from till 16. Okay. You, uh, I'm assuming, started to learn to sail on Lake Michigan. Is that uh, where, it's, where it started for you? Yes, yeah, so I started at South Shore Yacht Club, uh, Bayview, Wisconsin. Um, I lived in South Milwaukee and 
pretty much rode my bike until I was 16 years old every day to the club and back. And, and when I was a junior, I would just take the, or when I was a beginner, I would just take the beginner class. But once I got to the intermediate, I would help coach the, the juniors. And then once I got to advance, I would just show up every day and kind of become an assistant coach as well. So it was five days a week from, I don't know, 13 years old till, till, you know, 17, 18 years old. Sailing family. Yeah. I can talk the lessons. Sailing family. Dad sailed, right? Yes. Yeah. My dad sailed. My grandpa sailed. Uh, other grandpa was in the Coast Guard. So it's always been, we've always been on the water. Do you remember, I, this is sort of a threat to ask some of the, some of the, uh, some of the veterans. Is there, is there a time you remember when you knew this was, now we're going to talk a little bit about your football career, but when was sailing, when you knew it in your head, when was it, when did it become the obsession? Uh, well, I think the obsession started when I was a kid. I, I just, I loved going down to the club and hopping in, whether it was the, uh, the, the laser is what I can really remember. The opti sailing stuff, that, that's too far back. I can't remember that. But um, sailing the lasers, uh, we had a Finn Gold Cup in Milwaukee in 1983, and I was about 16 years old. <clears throat> and I would take my laser out and watch the Finn Gold Cup guys. And, you know, those were like my idols back in the day. And I would trade out. I would jump in someone's fin, and then they would hop my laser, and we'd sail back to shore. And so, so I've been pretty much sailing, you know, full on since then. Um, as far as when did I know I was going to make it my career, I guess – it was the day that my, uh, I was a stockbroker for two years and it was the day that my managing broker said, make up your mind. Do you want to be a sailor? Or do you want to be a broker? And I said, I'm going to go be a sailor. So I asked him if he wanted my two weeks notice now, or, or if I can just go, it was, it was getting ready for Key West race week. And it was another week that I'd asked off for work. And at that point, that, that time I was also talking with America True and Don Riley, you know, another Michigan uh, person. So I had a trial with them in San Francisco. I did Key West race week, a few other things, um, did a training session with them in uh in uh new zealand for uh, eight months and then actually ended up leaving that team and joined um coleus with abracadabra for that first one so um but yeah that's when i knew was was when my managing broker said when do you want you know make up your mind and i was like yeah i'm gonna go do this for for a living it seems to me that guys who sail for a living have a much greater passion than guys that play a lot of other professional sports and I'm, i think part of it's because you can be competitive in an older age yeah I think that's yeah, the that's you can't play football at 50, but you can certainly be a nationally ranked sailor at 50. I think that's the, the common thread. And if you look at junior programs, what junior program in any other sport stops during the summer because there's a Chicago to Mackinac or there's a Port Huron to Mackinac race, at least in our area. So <laughs> you stop everything because all those guys are involved, I think, is, is part of that is part of that discussion. Mm -hmm. You sailed most of the Great Lakes? Um, well, yeah, when I was younger, but I also, after, after I graduated from uh, Northern Michigan, where I went to undergrad, I moved to Miami for grad school. And then that's when I <clears throat> really started sailing more, uh, especially the stars. Um, when I first got down there, uh, I moved there the day before hurricane Andrew. And so school was closed. And so I ended up living on a catamaran right outside the coral reef yacht club and U S sailing center and, uh, and came back and kind of helped basically everybody clean up all the boats and the mud and the you know, the destruction from the hurricane um, and then started, you know, it was, it was 92. So all the boats were coming back from the Olympics and I was helping unload the containers and um, Mark Reynolds was coming off the star boat and um, Andy Zavaya, who's a very good coach, coached the Finn guys, coach star guys. He's one of the greatest coaches. And he was actually the, the guy that I met in Wisconsin in 83 for the Finn gold cup that, you know, so when I came back to mine, I was like, man, this guy looks familiar. And he's like, Mark. And I was like, Andy, he's like, Oh, so, you know, 14 years later, you know, I was 13 years old when we met now I'm 20, or whatever or 22 and I was just a good reunion but he was like hey you got to get in the star boat so he introduced me to Augie Diaz and Ding Schoonmaker and a couple other guys down in in Miami and I started selling with them and doing pretty well and and went to school and then like I said I became a stockbroker a couple you know, after after I graduated with a little stint of arena football in there and and then the cup stuff so well, let me get let me, just, let me just back up briefly you, you play obviously sure. you played quarterback in, in high school enough yeah. to be a college quarterback and go play at Northern Michigan. And I think you played three years there. You ended up being a tight end your last year. Uh, yeah, I was, um, I was redshirted my first year. Um, very limited backup time. I was actually the third string quarterback. And then um, my junior year or my you know fourth year, I got switched, uh, moved over to tight end, but I also did all special teams. So when I was a quarterback, my third year, I was also the holder. Um, and then my junior, senior, year, I was the long snapper. Um, and so I was on punt teams and a lot of the uh, uh, special teams, as well as the kind of a wingback slash tight end in there. But in high school, I played quarterback um, and defensive end. So at, 
college, it was kind of like, which one do you want to go for? And I had a pretty strong right. arm, so they decided to put you at quarterback. But then as I grew, I got to 215, 225, 35. And then that's when they said, okay, you're tight end now. So I switched to tight end and finished off the last two there. You spending time sailing in Marquette? Uh, you know, I think I sailed an ensign or something up there for a weekend with a buddy or something, but nothing, nothing serious. Um, it's too cold to sail in Lake Superior. Especially That's that time of year, we, especially in, you know, in April, we just, before you leave, I, I suppose it would be fine in July. What I was going to ask you earlier is you sailed, obviously grew up sailing Lake Michigan. Are the, do you think the Great Lakes are all the same in terms of the way they sail? Do you think that Michigan is similar to Huron? I, we hear stories that, you know, guys think that different lakes have different characteristics. Characteristics. I'm just wondering if you thought that was true. Um, so I've sailed in, you know, Milwaukee. I've done the Max, <clears throat> Chicago. I think it, you know, if you're sailing in Chicago, it can be, you know, you can get 12 foot seas and you can get, you know, 30 knots out of the Northeast, get the Northeast are coming in. If you're in, you know, Detroit or Bayview area, you're sailing more of a, a lake thing. If you're um, in Cleveland, Ohio, you get, it's a shallower lake. So the waves don't quite build up as much. So it's a little bit choppier. So there is, you know, every location you go to has got its own characteristics. You know, some are, some can be lighter, some can be heavier. You know, it could be like, you know, Auckland, New Zealand, where the average wind speed's 15 knots is perfect, but it's like, it's either gonna blow two or it's gonna blow 35, you know, like, which is kind of what we're seeing right now with the postponements. Um, but, you know, it's all weather dependent, right? You never know what you're gonna get. But it is a little different, I'd say. Each each venue is a little bit different. A great training for somebody growing up because you have all these different conditions depending upon where you might be sailing. You now live in San Diego. I lived there for a long time. It's probably the best sailing conditions I think of any place in the, that I've been. You know, it's always seems like about eleven o'clock, twelve o'clock in the in the morning. The breeze comes up to about eight, nine, ten, and it's there to you know sail on the bay is I think a lot of fun there. I, I think there's very consistent um, conditions. Yeah, it's, it is one of those places where you can just about sail every day of the year. Um, there are certain times like in the spring and the fall where it can get a little windy. Uh, and typically we don't, you know, you do a few of the hot rums or some of the other smaller events in the Bay Area, but most of the bigger events happen out, um, out in the ocean. And what you do is once you exit San Diego Bay, you turn left and you go down towards Mexico and you get about three miles down there. And there's also a spot where the valley, it's, it's a valley. So the, where the mountains kind of come down where San Diego is and where Tijuana is, you know, if it's blowing in the morning or if it's the morning, a lot of times you get that exit, you know, off land. And then all of a sudden, at, like you said, 10 or 11 o'clock, you get the land heating up a little bit and then it kind of starts to suck in that area. So it can be, you know, it can blow 20, 25 down here, but probably, you know, over 50% of the time, it's like 10 to 14, 15 knots. It's just perfect. So, and then you've got the waves to deal with. So San Diego, you get a little bit of wave, but then you get the, the long swell from the, from the Pacific ocean. So that's a tricky spot to sail. And what, and which is one thing about San Diego, if you look at the quality of guys that have come from San Diego, you've got, you know, Mark Reynolds, you know, Vince Brune, you know, Z George Zabo, Doyle, you got a whole, Dennis Connor, Peter Eisler. I mean, there's a really long list. I'd, I'd, I'll stop there, but there's many more guys that are from San Diego that have just, you know, made sail in their careers. Beer league racing in the old days. And I, that was the guy who sat on the back of the boat with beer league racing. You look out and you'd see five boats going by and they don't have somebody on it that had a World Cup, America's Cup experience or, or international level experience. And the other side of that is the one thing we've, with this show that's been really surprising is, and I'm, I'm a casual cruising sailor when I, we started this, but the, the part of this show that's amazing is just how much talent comes out of the Midwest and comes out of the Great Lakes. It's, mm -hmm. it's pretty phenomenal when you start to look at the guys like yourself who you know earned reputations and, and livings at, at, at the sport that uh, that we love and, and enjoy. Just a brief stop. College football. Give, talk a little bit briefly before we get into the sailing part of it. You spent some time in Orlando with Predators as an arena football quarterback, I believe, right? Yeah, yeah. So after college, my last year, or my last game of the season in college, I, I ended up. Um, I was on punt team, and in the second quarter, I was long snapper, went down the field, got clipped, went through the air sideways and got hit in the back by our contain man. So his knee came up and hit me in the back and I broke two vertebrae in my back. So um, I was kind of done with any kind of, not that I was going to go NFL, which you know, I don't think there was a chance that I'd ever make NFL, uh, but there was no chance of me really going anywhere else. And so I you know, took a couple months to recover, get my back back in shape. And then when I went to Miami for two years, um, I was playing the intramural football with the graduate students. So we had all the you know, the older guys that weren't the Pikes or the Teaks or the, the you know, the sports sort of um, uh, clubs and stuff and the, the fraternities. 
And right. I took us to the, the final game of the, of the intramural league both years. And, and the second year, someone said, Hey, did you ever play pro or, you know, did you, you know, ever, you know, try out anywhere? And I was like, no, I never played. And he's like, well, there's a, there's a tryout at the orange bowl for the Miami Hooters. And in 1994, Miami had a team called the Miami Hooters. So uh, there was probably 600 people that, that came to the orange bowl and maybe 15 or 20 quarterbacks. And I ended up making, I was the last quarterback selected. So I made the Miami Hooters. Uh, we did about three months of practice in Miami. Um, we did our first exhibition game up in Atlanta against the Orlando Predators. And after that game, you had to basically go from your 45 guys, 46 guys down to your, your final roster, which I think was 26 at the time. So arena is only, it's an eight on eight football thing. Anyway, so I got cut uh, from Miami. And the next day I got a phone call from the coach at Orlando and said, Hey, would you like to come up to Orlando and, you know, play for us? And I was like, well, my mom was standing right there. I was like, I guess I'm going to Orlando. You know, why not go up to Orlando and play, you know, play some football for a summer. So I did that. I was still, you know, I didn't start. I, did, I, I was basically the hamburger squad quarterback of, uh, of arena football. And I got to play the quarterbacks of the other teams we were playing. So I had the chart of like, okay, you guys are going to do this on two, on two, ready? And then we'd, we'd go do our, our thing. But um, yeah, never, never got any playing time in arena, but I was a backup quarterback for a year. And it was, it was, a, it was a fun season. It was a good summer job. Uh, we went to the arena bowl, but we lost the arena bowl which was a, was a tough loss, but uh, out of college, you had, you worked in finance before you really got into sailing. I think your first national win was 97. If I'm yeah, not mistaken in the uh, North American stars. Yeah. With uh, Joel Londrigan out of the what Midwest, your, out of Illinois. What is your, what was your degree in from Northern? Uh, business management. Okay. So that that's kind of moves in that direction. Just, it's just curious. Was the, the win in 97 sort of put you on the map a little bit nationally? Yeah, I think so. Um, and part of the reason was, well, Joe Londrigan was a very good star. So he, he had won the Worlds in 93 with, with a crew, Phil Trinner. And I'm not sure how many other wins he's had, but he had a lot of wins. And so it was our first regatta together. It was North Americans. And all the California guys were there for the trials. So Mark Reynolds was there. Vince Brun was there. Um, Eric Doyle, George Zabo, uh, and, and a few other guys that were kind of the, the top of their game then. And I can, I still remember the last beat going up because it wasn't, nobody had won it yet. It could have been Vince, could have been Mark Reynolds, could have been us. And it was in Marina Del Rey and Marina Del Rey can be pretty light and shifty. And we led around the lured Mark and Vince went left and Mark went right. And we're like, oh boy, you know, <laughs> who do we cover? You know, and, and so we ended up kind of hedging a little bit to the left and, and we got Mark and, but on the, the right-hand side, I think it was Vince that was coming in. And it was one of those if we get a little lefty, we're ahead. If we get a little righty, he's ahead. And it just turned out to be, we got the lefty and we crossed ahead and we won it. So that was a pretty, that was a pretty big win. Is but Star yeah, your favorite? Season. Is your Star your favorite boat? Yeah, yeah. Star is my favorite well, boat. Why? Uh, I think it's the, it's the competition. It's the camaraderie. You know, all the crews get together. It's, a, it's just a two-person boat, so it's simple. Um, you know, you start racing on bigger boats and, and that's a lot of fun as well. Like, don't get me wrong. I, I love TP 52s and the 72s and the, you know, the maxis back in the day, all that. But, um, you know, the star is a very, it's a very technical boat. So when you're sailing star, it's not just, you know, let's go out and pull the main sheet on. It's, you know, where do you set your rig up, your intermediates, your lowers, your cap tensions, your, you know, your upper backstays, your lower check, like where do you settle the stuff? And every condition is a little bit different. And it's also a very physical boat. So, you, you know, you need big guys to crew um, and big skippers to sail them as well. I mean, it's not, if you have a 150 or 160 pound person driving a star, they're going to have a hard time pulling the main sheet in in 20 knots. Um, for me personally, I think 180 pound person to 220 is kind of a very good sweet spot for a skip, skipper and about 250 to 220 is a sweet spot for a crew. Um, you know, they're talking about lowering the weight limit now, but I'm against that. <laughs> You're, you're obviously former football player, so you're about 6'5", and I'm guessing 230, 240, somewhere in that ballpark. Yeah, I wish. Uh, <laughs> I weighed this morning. I was 259. So, <laughs> uh, you know, I just came off Bacardi. Got to give me a break, you know. No, I, Not Flanagan's. <laughs> in the picture behind you, I, I, I had admiration. I was on a star for the first time last year in my life, and you know, I guess just kind of sit over, and I didn't realize the body core strength it takes to sit over the edge. And then pull yourself back up. I'm 66. I'm an athlete, but you know it's one of those things. I have great respect for having sailed that boat in almost no wind, just to learn a little bit. I'm just when you guys sail it, it does take a pretty athletic guy to be able to competitively to be able to sail those boats and sail them well. I don't think that's a. Yeah. And they're they're light. What do those boats weigh? 
Uh, 1,492 pounds, I think is the, is the, is the limit. They have to be at least that, <clears throat> I believe I might be wrong. I'm not sure, but, uh, just under 1500 pounds. Um, so as the crew, you're, you know, potentially could be 450 of that, which right. is, you know, one third of the boat. So you can still, you know, you're downwind. You're I'm very physical. You know, I get up on the foredeck and I stand at the mast and you're moving forward and back and in and out. Um, but when you're upwind, it's, it's pretty much hang over the side of the boat, arms out, you know, get as much leverage as you can, a little bit of forward and backness in the waves. And you kind of try to ride the boat like a bull. You know, when it goes down, you're going back. And when it goes up, you're going forward. Um, but yeah, it's a very physical boat. And, you know, that's probably one of the biggest reasons why I like the boat. This past weekend, which the picture points out, you were in the, you, had, you sailed in the Bacardi's in Florida. Am I correct? Yes. Yeah. How'd you do down there? <clears throat> we finished ninth of, I think there was 27 boats entered. Um, we had a second one race was late, which was like our, you know, that was the gold moment because, um, the people that won, the two guys that won it were Mateusz Kuznerowicz and Bruno Prada. Uh, they're defending champions. And this week, this year, they won the regatta, the Bacardi cup with all firsts. So that's never been done before. So those guys just, it was, a, it was like a sailing school lesson that they did. They just were smooth. They went the right way. They started well, they did everything, you know, textbook. And, you know, we were fortunate enough. I think it was race six or something, five or six, maybe the, the, the second last day, we ended up with a second. And we actually, uh, <clears throat> we ended up leading around the weather mark and then leading around the lured mark. And then Mateusz passed us on the third upwind leg, held the lead on the downwind and then, and then extend a little bit more on the final upwind. Um, but it was just great to have, you know, guys like Augie Diaz and John McCausland and some of the other world champions able behind us. Um, you know, you're in good, you know, you're in good company when you're up with those guys. Mark, you've been very successful on stars for a long time. And I've never really had a chance to ask this question. As you continue to keep the status of, of being very successful, age creeps in. And obviously, we don't get better with age. We get, you know, right. we, we lose a little bit. Is it technology? Is it the experience? Is it the, the, the physicality? What keeps you improving? And then what keeps you at the top of the list? Is it, is it a combination of all of that? And if that's true, then what's the most important in that as you get older? Uh, yeah, I think it's a combination of all that, but I think you have to have a mindset that you're just, you just always want to learn, you know, and if you go into the thing, like you think you're the, the best, and you know, everything about the star boat, then you're, you know, you're, you're mistaken. Um, so I try to go out there and learn from everybody. I tend to sail with a lot of different skippers and I try to pass along what I know. And I try to gather what, you know, what they know, because you know, every, pretty much every single time I sail with a new person, I learn something new, whether it's, you know, like on the starboard, I was, I was used to go up to the bow and tie the bowline on the, on the little loop that we have up there, you know, and, and then you got to go up there and untie it when you eat sail and blah, blah, blah. Now I just bring, I feed the line through the loop and I bring it to the vein track. How simple is that? You know, but I learned it. I'm like, Oh, no, I don't have to, you know, crawl away after I just undo the bolt here, pull through like nothing. So that was tradition, something. tradition go out the window when there's an easier way to do something, right? That's right. Exactly. Internationally, you've got a career also as a, as a grinder and you were talk a little bit about your connection to Buddy Melgis in terms of the Wisconsin connection and sort of finding a track to the America's Cup level. Well, Buddy, Buddy was always like an idol of mine. You know, he's he was winning gold medals when I was, you know, born or, you know, a few years old. Um, and the way that I got introduced to Buddy was, you know, being from Wisconsin, um, we had a sign of a kind of a connection. But the first time I met him and talked to him was during, I think it was 1990. Oh, it would have been like mid 90s. It was a Finn Gold, or not a Finn Gold. It was a Melgus uh, Gold Cup that was held in Lake Geneva. And he, buddies, you know, typical buddies at Lake Geneva on his tractor and he's helping all the guys launch their boats and drive them down the parking lot and, and just helping everybody and talking to everybody and telling jokes and, you know, typical buddy. And I asked him, I said, you know, how do, how does a guy like me get on America's cup team? And he's like, well, you got a resume. And I was like, yep. He goes, well, why don't you give me your resume and I'll sign a little, you know, note on it and I'll send it off to Don Riley because Don and buddy are also very good friends and send it off to Don and basically Don, said, yeah, come on up to San Francisco for a tryout. And that was, that was thanks to Buddy. Um, uh, and then he was also on the boat a lot with America True. So just learning from him and being around him was, you know, something that you never forget, right? It's, he's a legend. <laughs> what does it take to be a good grinder? Besides physicality? Uh, physicality, I think uh, stamina and endurance. You know, nowadays, you, you know, when I was grinding, 
it could be, you could do one tack in a beat, you could do 30 tacks in a beat. So you basically had to be ready for the 30. Um, but in our day, it was, you know, you just, tr you just got in the gym, you did your three days of, you know, working out, you did your three days of cardio. And we also used to do, uh, we'd, we'd switch it up by having either a yoga class, or we'd do a boxing class, or we'd do a month of rugby, or we do, you know, so you did like different sports to just kind of keep your body guessing, right? You're like, you always want to build everything on a boat because you, you use everything. But I think nowadays with the guys, they're just, you know, it's like nonstop grinding. And they're, you know, they're, you look at their heart rates when they do the, the, you know, they put the crew up there and they got all the biometrics on their body. And you know, this guy's at 185 and this guy's at 179. And then you look at the skippers and they're about 85, 90. And, you know, so you, you just have to be in shape. And because there's weight limits, you know, there's not, I don't, I don't know if there's any 250 pound or 260 pound grinders out there anymore. I think it's more, you know, maybe the 200 to 220 pounds, super fit, you know, the, the rowers, the, um, you know, the, the adrenaline guys or not the adrenaline, the uh, endurance guys, the guys that are just, you know, doing something for a long, you know, right. they could do a 5,000 meter row and it'd be like, you know, not me. <laughs> no, I get that. America's true was a great experience. Is there any specific thing you learned from that, uh, that time with, with Don and with that whole America true group? Uh, I just think it was a, it was a fun time to be around a lot of those people. Um, Stu Argo was one of the guys at Michigan guy that was on there, Don, um, very positive people. I learned a ton about the, you know, that's where I kind of learned how to do a lot of my, uh, winch work and stuff. I was always a rigger, like I could, I could splice lines and things like that, but it kind of brought me to the next level of hydraulics and learning winches and things like that. Um, but I was with America true only for, it was about a year, but it was eight months in New Zealand. And then I actually left that team and went to uh, uh, John Coley's team in, in Hawaii. Um, so I lived in Hawaii for eight months and then came back and did the America's Cup in 2000 with the, team, the Abracadabra team. And that was also you know, a great experience, you know, living in Hawaii and learning from those guys and you know, another great group of sailors on that boat too. So um, yeah, that was good. This is an unrelated question, but is, is professional sailing at the level you're at conducive for family life and having a normal life since you're sort of like that athlete that kind of comes and goes. You mentioned you come to Miami and you're in Hawaii and different places. I wonder if it, if it has its toll on a personal life. <laughs> well, you're yeah, I did a lot of travel. Yeah, no, you're smiling looking off camera. I'm guessing your girlfriend is sitting there, but it, yeah. you're, it, 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 is a, it is a vagabond. It is a vagabond life, right? Is that a fair statement? It is. Yeah, it is. And you know, after I graduated, it was a lot of, you know, living on friends' couches. They called me America's guest because I was, you know, if I traveled through this town, I knew someone that lived there and I'd crash air and then I'd go down to the, the, the regatta. And um, it was after the 2003 America's Cup that I thought, okay, I got to, you know, I got to settle down a little bit. So I, I bought a little piece of property in, in Florida in West Palm Beach and settled down there for a little about while, but it was still a lot of travel. Um, back in the, you know, the probably the late 90s, 2000s, up to maybe 2010 or so, um, I was on the road 200 to 250 days a year, you know, somewhere, whether it was Italy or you know, Miami or California or wherever. Um, the last probably three or four years or probably five years, it's been um, less than 100, like 70 or 80 days. But I've got, you know, I'm doing this product. Um, uh, my, you know, my girlfriend's got this studio. So we, I've been working on this and I try to help her out when I can here. And I just physically, I can't do as much as I could back in the day, you know, like, I came back after this regatta and this was a windy regatta and, you know, my knees are feeling it, you know, when you're over the side and you got to hop up, you know, I, I cheat now, I come up and grab the backstay and pull myself up. You know, it used to be back in the day, I just, you know, do the leg up and slide in and I can't do that anymore. So I'm definitely feeling it. Some more aches and pains in the body. Um, but, but that is one nice thing, you know, the star is a physical boat, but if you sail, uh, you know, uh, other big boats, you, it's, it's physical in the fact that like, I would be a grinder. So you're grinding the sails in, but you're not like beating yourself up on the boat. You're not smashing around on it. And, you know, if a small, small boats tend to like jolt a lot quicker than big boats do you walk around in a big boat on a small boat, you're, it's a tight boat, like a star, you're hitting this and banging into that. And it's all over the place. Any, just curious, any day cruising or any, any cruising sailing of any kind in, in, in your background, or is that something that if you're not going Mach 1, you're not happy. Um, and, you know, when I was younger, my parents had a, uh, it was a Sea Tiger 41. It was a 41-foot Taiwanese wooden boat that we used to, we'd sail across the lake for the Queen's Cup, and then we'd get to Muskegon or Grand Haven, and then we would take the boat north and get up towards Mackinac and then cross over 
you know, down Green Bay and do that whole thing, Sheboygan, and then back to Milwaukee. It would just be a two week trip around the, around the lake. Um, and, you know, we did that, you know, for probably seven, eight, nine years or so that I, that I did that with them. And then, um, but as far as like just going out on a cruise, it's been a while. I think the, uh, you know, just for a day sale, it's, you know, <laughs> I don't get I mean, out that often on day sales. I've asked that question. Somebody asked me the other day, I'm a ski coach in the wintertime, ski racing coach. I have literally ski raced for 45, coached for 40 years and raced for another 10. And I don't think I've ever been in a mogul field because I just want to go fast. And it's, it's, there's some, you know, I don't go out in the, the deep snow. I just like to go fast. And I think yeah. there's a, I think race sail racers like to, to race. I'm not sure that they want to sit on the back of a boat and drink a beer. They'd rather race and then drink the beer on, on, on shore. And I think there's a, a certain truth to that. Ah, the yeah, I agree. America's cup just is in the process of finishing up and you've had some experience in it. Any, any thoughts on what's, what's happened in the last uh, few weeks? You've obviously um, watched I, the races. Yeah, I watched um, a little bit of when Ineos was with Prada, and then I saw a few, you know, not, it's you know, because of the time difference and stuff, and I had the regatta this week, I wasn't able to catch a whole lot of it, but, um, you know, I just know that Jimmy Spithill's like, for me, he's, he's the best starter in match racing cup stuff that, that there is out there. And I, in 2003, I sailed with One World, and Jimmy was like our B-boat skipper, and, but we kept beating up on, on Peter Gilmore, and then they're like, all right, Jimmy, you got to start because you're the better starter. So Jimmy took over at One World, and um, as far as driving the, the A-boat and everything, and uh, his time and distance, his, you know, his smoothness, his calm demeanor, everything is just, you know, you look at him and Francesco, and they're just, they're money. And I, I also like the fact that they each take turns driving. This whole run around the back of the boat, let someone else drive for a second, and then you know, step back in. I think there's, there's, you know, when you lose two, three knots in attack because, you know, maybe a little jolt or something, you know, that two, three knots makes, you know, 50 yard, 50 meters. And all of a sudden, next thing you know, we're 1800 meters, you know? Yeah. I like the, I like the cups when it was like the mono hulls and we're point, you know, you're coming at each other on, you know, 30 degree angles and it was tacking duels. Now it's kind of like, if you had starboard attack advantage in the start, you know, or, or a gap to weather, he hits the boundary and tacks over. You just lay up underneath them. And from that point, point on, it's, it's kind of game over because you just keep, keep hitting boundaries. And it's so easy to protect. I keep thinking that, and I've said this a hundred times on the show, I don't think it's sailing when you're wearing a helmet. But <laughs> part of that same discussion is that Gary Jobson penned something in January about the possibility that if it went back to the New York Yacht Club, we might go back to monohulls. That was kind of a conversation for a couple of weeks. That obviously didn't happen as they dropped out. But... Part of the process is you know, I watch people who don't necessarily understand sailing and you'll go through the te television channel and come to NBC and these spaceships are racing, going back and forth. And there's no commonality of looking at something. And a lot of the change happened in, in San Diego in 88 when we have, you know, monohulls against, you know, catamarans. Do you think we ever get back to something that's a little more traditional or do you think we just keep pushing the envelope with technology? Um, I think if New Zealand wins, it'll probably stay in the foiling monohulls and they're going to do something very similar. Um, if not keep the same thing and do a, a next generation of it. Um, you know, I don't have any, you know, one's told me directly, but I, I just had a feeling that if it would have been Prada or, or Great Britain in the finals and they would have won that I think it would have gone back to some sort of a monohull more keel boat ish. I remember in the 07 cup, I was with victory challenge and they had talked about, you know, we had done five generations of that class. It was 92 in San Diego, 95, 2000, 2003, and seven. So you had five generations of the IACC boats. And, you know, my feeling was as you went from that 92, 18 feet wide, all these different things to like 2007, the boats got very narrow and they all of a sudden became like very one design. And then it became more of a sailor race slash sailmaker race versus the, you know, the designer race. Cause all, all the designers had been with the other teams and you, know, you right. got to a point where that's the rule and everybody's got the same boat. Um, but yeah, I think it, it would be nice to go back to some kind of monohulls. The, these things are great. Maybe the GP50 class that, that Coots and Ellison had started might be the, that might be where they take the technology and, and try to go for, you know, go with that. But it might sound like the same catamarans too. I think those guys like catamarans. Well, I understand America's Cup rules for 150 years has always been about technology and moving it forward. And that's why I've changed after those, those long years of having 12 meters. But with the shrinking world of sailing, and just because there's not a lot of folks that are younger than us buying boats. You would thought that, I mean, I don't see very many foils on Lake St. Clair. I just don't. You see a UFO, you see some, 
so if you're going to something that's going to go to push the, the envelope, um, you'd think you'd want to have the boats at the highest level be able to be a little more um, familiar to those who are maybe trying to get into the sport at a younger age. And I, I sometimes think they get lost in translation because it just looks too complicated. Yeah, it looks complicated. The The whole foiling thing, though, I think is it's, you know, when you have a Club 420 and a, and a moth or something, the moth is so much harder to learn how to sail, but once you get up on it, it's great. But I think the, you know, if, if you start progressing from the moth and get a, you know, much a bigger, bigger boat, you also have to start worrying about, are you, you know, now you got to wear a helmet or if you fall right. over at 30 knots, you're going to rupture your spleen or you're going to, you're going to do something else. So there's the technology that it's great for the, maybe the highest end athletes in sailing, but for, you know, for the kids, you know, unless, you know, there's a big learning curve to get up to that. Like I tried foiling a couple of times in a UFO and on a wasp and UFO is tough, but uh, I was able to get up on the wasp for a little bit, but it's gotta be blowing 25 for me to get up, you know, right. And those things are, you know, they're little. <laughs> well, what's next for you? Um, next I've got, um, <clears throat> the spring championship in Miami in April, and that's another star event. Um, it's, they're combining the Miami Springs with the Western hemisphere Springs, So it's actually going to be, uh, a silver star event. And then in May I'm here in San Diego, going to do yachting cup. And then, um, and then it, it's either back to, um, there's a lot of West coast regattas. San Diego's got regattas, Santa Barbara, LA, and they're bringing back the Calvin page in San Francisco. And then on the East coast, there's there's other districts, there's district uh, one and four in the star class that have races in Annapolis and in Lake Seneca and Detroit and Chicago and, you know, Midwestern lakes, Gull Lake, Michigan. We want to do the tulip tune up. So it's, you know, it's, it's one or two a month from now until, you know, whenever it's always been one or two a month. <laughs> Listen, I appreciate your time. I appreciate your time joining us and, and talking a little bit about it. Um, we're going to put your uh, information on the bottom of this so they can see for the the cleat so we can get okay. a little get a little promotion off of it and uh i wish you the best for the rest of the summer hopefully covid doesn't kill us uh, any more than it has and we kind of get a chance to get a little more uh get a little more time back on the water and uh mark it's been a real pleasure to be able to talk to you oh great thank you thank you for the interview appreciate it